Well, we're beginning a new book tonight, a new book for us, that is, uh, the book of Proverbs. And uh, it's a very, very different kind of study than most of the ones we've had. And uh, we'll try to take about four chapters today. It is part of what's called by librarians and such the wisdom literature. In the Old Testament, that would include the book of Proverbs, of course, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job, and the Psalms, at least a certain uh, subset of them. And it's interesting that uh, three out of the five were written by the same guy, a guy that goes by the name of Solomon. And one of the surprising uh, discoveries for many of you is that that's not his real name. His name given by Nathan at birth was Jedidiah. Solomon was his royal name. And before the, our study of the book is over, we're going to find some other surprises about, uh, uh, from the pen of Solomon. But uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. There are several books in the New Testament that could be classified in the same category. We have in the Old Testament, Second uh, Chronicles 1, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 1 and James 3 are often classed by some commentators as being of the same character as the so-called wisdom literature. But the book of Proverbs is a book on how to wise up and live. It's a how-to book. It's a how-to book on lifestyle. And it's a very unusual book the more you get into it. So many of us sort of plunge into the book or even sometimes pick it up randomly. And uh, it seems to be a catch bucket of all kinds of little one-liners, or I should say really two-liners, and uh, uh, not much, there's no organization that's too apparent unless you study it carefully. It's interesting, there, there is in the scripture a number of allusions to animals that are clean that chew the cud. And those allusions may sound strange to us, but to the Hebrew mind, that's an instruction on how to study. Many of these passages, and it wouldn't limit it to the book of Proverbs, but it exemplifies what I'm about to say is you really won't get it by just reading the chapter. You've got to really digest it. Reread it, reread it, and digest it. And uh, that's going to be uh, proved to be very true. But anyway, it's God's book on, on uh, to, to, um, how to live your life. And it's beyond just keeping laws. So many of us especially as we get a biblical orientation where are you under the law or not and all that business. There's something that's far beyond that, and that's what the book of Proverbs is really focusing on. It focuses on leading an aggressive, dynamic lifestyle. How many are interested in doing that? It's about 40%. Well, I don't know. Maybe. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. Proper and improper attitudes are dealt with. Attitudes are tough, but it's going to deal a lot with that. And of course, conduct and other characteristics. They are referred to in very concise, succinct, penetrating ways. One of the reasons, probably, we need to realize that in ancient Israel, they didn't have copying machines, didn't have printing presses. Many people wouldn't have a personal copy of the Torah and so forth. So one of the ways you instructed your children was by instructing your children with memorable uh, reminders regarding uh, not just the do's and don'ts around the house, but life itself. And that's what we see collected here. The word proverb itself in the Hebrew is mashal. It's a proverb, a parable, a comparison, an aphorism um, on typically ethical wisdom and, and things of that nature. Short sentences from long experience is one, I thought, quotable definition. They're easy to remember. They condense a lot of wisdom in a small space. One of the things that we'll probably include in the workbook when we turn this into a course will be the challenge of the students to take a parable and try to summarize it in just one paragraph. And you'll discover that's a tough job. Many of the parables are obvious as you understand what they're grasping, but trying to express that in other words takes more than just a few sentences or even a paragraph. It's a, it, it causes you to, rec- to appreciate 
the compression, the, 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 the digestion that has gone in here. The, word, the, the synonym, I think, that in the Hebrew proverb comes the closest is a comparison. Because the proverb and parable are very pro, uh, broad terms, but the proverb, that we're, as we're going to encounter, it, is a very specific style. But before we get into the biblical, uh, let's uh, try to understand what we mean by a proverb. When the well is dry, we know the worth of water. That was one of Ben Franklin's favorite. That says a lot in just one sentence. It captures a whole attitude towards certain kinds of circumstances. When you want a drink of milk, you don't buy the whole cow, is a homespun expression that many of you that are raised on a farm probably uh, may sound familiar. What uh, the ancient Romans used to talk about, their politicians, they would say the cat would eat the fish, but she doesn't want to get her feet wet. <laughs> you know, the people that would like to have the rewards, but really don't want to make the effort or get the risk or the exposure. This is one of my favorite by Mark Twain. Always do right. This will gratify some and astonish the rest. <laughs> Harry Truman liked that so much that he had it framed and hung over his, uh, a, a desk in the uh, Boval office. But, uh, so these are man's proverbs, and some of them are very, very um, interesting. But they're quite different than the ones in the Scripture. And I'll come to some differences in a minute. Authorship, of course, obviously this was written by Solomon. He wrote about 3,000 Proverbs according to 1 Kings 4. He was the wisest person in his day according to the Scripture. And uh, he reigned from about 971 to 931. So all of these we can ascribe to the 10th century. Chapters 25 through 29 in the book of Proverbs were written by Solomon apparently, but were compiled by the men of Hezekiah. And since Hezekiah reigned from 729 to 686, bear in mind we're B.C., so the obviously decreasing numbers are less long ago, okay? <laughs> but you get the idea. But the thing we want to recognize is who the real author is. One of the astonishing things, if you study the book of Proverbs, you will find in it no technical faux pas. So many of us have misconceptions about scientific things, and especially in ancient times. And one of the fascinating studies about the Bible is that those notions that prevailed during the days of the ancient writers don't get into the text. It's astonishing that Moses, uh, who was raised in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, were told, uh, all the wisdom of the Egyptians, they had some pretty weird ideas about medicine. And they're very colorful. I won't derail the study going through that again, except to point out, remind you, that none of those things get into the Torah. And quite the contrary, an astonishing number of medical advances are uh, anticipated in this Torah. The more you know about particle physics, the more you know about Einstein's theory of relativity, the more you know about the anthropic principle that scientists talk about, the more comfortable Genesis chapter 1 and the rest of it reads. But the same thing here. But the, one of the things we want to recognize, the real author here is not Solomon. It's, it was superintended by God himself. Paul tells us that in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's an important verse to remember as we wade through some of the tough areas in the Old Testament. They're there by design for our learning. All scripture, the scripture says is given by inspiration of God. That word in the Greek actually means God breathed. So even though the styles, the form, may reflect the people doing the penmanship, God is superintending every letter. We now know with computers and the structures that lie under the text, there's no way those properties could be simulated. And, and they, 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 you, you remove one letter out of the Torah and those, many of those properties just fall apart. So it's a very, very provocative discovery. Um, the addressees here are typically sons. The words, my son, were written by Solomon 15 times in the first seven chapters and a couple of times elsewhere. They're used five times in the saying of the wise men in elsewhere and once in one of the last chapters. My sons occurs four times all by Solomon. So as we read this, let's recognize the context of the passage is the home, the father teaching the son. And uh, uh, 
The more you read the book, the more you'll respect the incredible background those sons got from their father. So Rehoboam, uh, you can visualize Rehoboam sitting at his feet and Solomon giving this counsel. The New Testament quotes extensively from the book of Proverbs. We don't need to go through these, but it's, it's just noteworthy to see how frequently the, the, the impact that the book of Proverbs has on the New, Te- uh, New Testament literature. The key word in the book is wisdom. And uh, what is the first thing that God created? Remember James Dobson confronted this once at a meeting, and I was quite surprised with the answer, because we all, the answer is wisdom. We'll discover that when we get to chapter 8, that wisdom was there before. But also wisdom will be personalized here in several ways. But the traditional definition of wisdom is the ability to use knowledge in the right way. I think all of us know people that have an abundance of knowledge and no wisdom. And you, you, I think all of us could take out a pad and make a list of people we've encountered in our past that would seem to have a lot of knowledge, that is, a lot of data, but an incapacity to draw relevance from that and, more importantly, to put it into practice. See, so we would say a, a, that wisdom, thus, would be the ability to use knowledge in the right way. That's the traditional definition, but in the Scripture, it has a, quite a different complexion. See, there is a wisdom of this world. 1 Corinthians 2 speaks of that. James 3 speaks of that. You can look those up on your own. Divine wisdom is from above. And Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. When we get to Proverbs chapter 8, we're going to see, in the text, we'll see Jesus Christ uh, embody that text very specifically. But uh, we'll take a look here at... uh, 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 another passage here in a minute that will highlight that in 1 Corinthians. But uh, the word for wisdom in the uh, Hebrew is kokma. It occurs 40 times in Proverbs. And it would seem to mean being knowledgeable, experienced, and efficient in whosoever uh, areas of expertise is alluded to here. Being knowledgeable, but also experienced and efficient is Im- implied by the Hebrew term. Wisdom in the book of Proverbs includes a practical sagacity. A practical sagacity, mental, human, and functional skill, yes. But the real overriding emphasis is the moral aspect, the upright uh, living, which stems from the right relationship with God. And the key we're going to encounter in verse 7 of the first chapter, the key verse that will be repeated in chapter 9, that is the, the key, not just the book of Proverbs, but to the whole Bible. Where do you start? What, where, uh, how, do you, how do you get wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without the Lord, you won't have wisdom. We're going to talk about a lot of winners and losers here this evening. And if you want to avoid being a loser and be the one that is always the winner in, in, the, in the context of the book of Proverbs, the first thing you need to do is accept Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, you're, at, you're adrift. The fear of the Lord, the awe, the respect of God, is the beginning of wisdom. And that makes the Hebrew concept of wisdom wisdom unique, and we could go through a lot of verses there, but I think it'll be pretty self-evident as we go forward. So to be wise in the biblical sense, one must begin with a proper relationship to God. And you will not get a lot out of this study unless 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 you're in Christ. And uh, he, he is indeed the beginning of wisdom for each of us. Now, wisdom is described as eternal in Proverbs 8. That wisdom is permanent, eternal. Wisdom is the creator of all things, Proverbs 8 hammers away. And so we begin to realize that it's also personified in the person of Jesus Christ, who was the creator of the earth, a creator who actually entered his creation to fulfill a mission for you and I. And wisdom is described as the beloved of God. So when you see these identities, all out of chapter 8 primarily, uh, you begin to get an equivalence between wisdom and the person of Jesus Christ. 
And of course, to yield yourself to him and obey him is true wisdom. John 1, Colossians 1, and you could concatenate a number of verses to support that premise. It's interesting how man's proverbs are often, well, first of all, they're man's knowledge. Some of them are acute, some of them are descriptive, and I'm not here to disparage them, but I want, let's be sensitive to the fact that man's knowledge is self-contradictory, and we see it in our proverbs. Look before you leap. How many of you have heard that proverb? Right? He who hesitates is lost. Whoops, wait a minute. Which is true? Well, it depends on the context, of course. Okay? A man gets no more than he pays for. The best things in life are free. For everything else, there's master charge. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, leave well enough alone. Progress never stands still. Well, now, wait a minute. What, which is the, the, the prevailing one here? Many hands make light work, right? Too many cooks spoil the, <laughs> spoil the broth. See, we find common proverbs that are descriptive, but certainly not universal and certainly not... What the, in contrast to these, you're going to discover that the 3,000... We're not going to go through all 3,000 and all recorded in the book of Proverbs, but we're going to run, as we go through Solomon's Proverbs, they don't contradict. They don't contradict themselves. A rolling stone gathers no moss. The setting hen does not get fat. <laughs> well, <laughs> make up your mind. So guides for study. First thing that surprised me, and I frankly was quite relieved to discover, they are organized. I sort of had this fear that we're going to spend several weeks here going through a, just a scattered list of, of cute little two-liners. But as you go read the book of Proverbs, they seem helter-skelter. They seem to be sort of a, a bucket that they're picked out randomly somehow. No. See, that comes from a superficial view of them. And as you start getting into this, you will discover they're organized. In fact, Solomon tells you that. He doesn't tell you that in Proverbs. He tells you that in Ecclesiastes, that these things, these dark sayings are set in order. So there is an order, and our challenge is to try to understand that order. You won't understand the order. I'll give you a few hints to give you what to look for. But the way you'll understand it is to digest them, to reread them and reread them and digest them. And you'll begin to realize that there's a, there is a, a method underlying the thing. You'll also discover there are thumbnails of every character in the Bible. One of the interesting exercises you might do in your notepad as we go through and we start talking about some of these characters that are profiled here, who you think they might fit, both in the Bible and who you know personally. Um, you can keep that list very, very confidential. Something else I wanted to insert here that many people have noticed, and it's a useful observation. Proverbs happens to have 31 chapters, the way we have it organized in our English Bible. Each chapter has more than um, uh, 12 verses, okay? So what you can do is read a chapter every day. There are 31 chapters, so what you can do is the date, whatever date it is, you read that chapter. And when you miss it, you don't worry about going back because there's... You just, if, if today is the 22nd of whatever, you read chapter 22. That will take you through the book of Proverbs once a month, obviously. And it'll give you a sampling of some advice for the day. Some you will relate to and some will require more study. The fact that there's more than... I happen to pop through my mind that there's more than 12 verses in each chapter is a useful thing in cryptography. There is a code called the Playfair Code, which is a, uh, a manually operable uh, form of encryption that was used in World War II by the Germans because in every hotel room they could find a um, Gideon Bible. And by taking the date and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, they, they would take the, yeah, the date and the month the 12, to, for the verse and the chapter they could get a series of letters that would drive the key for the encryption. And what's handy about this, it requires no tools. You can, with a scratch pad in a hotel room, execute the, the code. And uh, I, I, it just popped in my mind when I was talking about Proverbs. The fact that it's got 12 verses is not useful to you. It's useful if you're going to play encryption games. But let's go on. <laughs> okay. The whole idea in Hebrew poetry, not just Proverbs, but also the Psalms and elsewhere, is the parallelism of ideas. 
You and I think of poetry as having two qualities, among others, that rhymes and meter. Rhymes and meter constitute a major part, at least of the structure, of poetry, as we think of it. In Hebrew, the poetry is always the cross-linking of ideas or concepts. And uh, so there are three kinds, to keep this simple, there's actually more kinds, but let's keep it simple. There are three kinds of parallelism that we'll encounter. Synonymous parallelism, antithetic parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. Now, synonymous parallelism, it's, all these involve a couplet of two clauses, two lines. And synonymous parallelism, the second clause simply restates what was given in the first clause. An example of that is in 19, uh, Proverbs 19.29, judgments are prepared for scorners and stripes for the back of fools. So that, see, they, that those lines say a different way, uh, the same thing, two different ways. But they're synonymous. Judgments prepared for scorners, stripes for the back of fools. Now we've encountered two vocabulary things here we'll come to in a little bit. Scorners and fools. We'll come back. To, there are three losers we're going to discover. And scorners and fools are two of the three. But anyway, the issue here is parallelism. Do you understand the parallelism idea? Okay. There's just the opposite of that, an antithetic parallelism. That's a truth which is stated in the first clause, but made stronger in the second clause by a contrast with an opposite truth. It's sort of like saying it's two sides of a coin, if you will. And uh, so... The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. And uh, that's an example of, of a reversal, if you will. Then there is synthetic parallelism. This is a little tougher. The second clause simply develops the thought of the first. Example in Proverbs 20, verse 2, The terror of a king is as the roaring of a lion. He that provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own life. Okay? So, uh, that's the, uh, that's, it, it continues the thought, or it gives the result of the thought, or it describes something that relates. It's, it's, that's called a, synth, you know, it's a synthesis. And so, those are the three kinds of parallelism. Well, let's jump in and take a look at the book itself. The first nine chapters will contrast wisdom on the positive side, and folly on the other side. In fact, it will indulge in a rhetorical device of treating them both as women who are calling on us. Wisdom is calling us to do one thing, folly another. And uh, both terms are feminine gender in the grammar of the Greek, of the, uh, excuse me, of the Hebrew, and uh, so they indulge in that as a rhetorical device. Chapters 10 through, after that introduction, chapters 10 through 24 will be the Proverbs of Solomon that were written in set order by himself. From chapters 25 to 29, there are also Proverbs of Solomon, but these appear to be ones that were collected and set in order by the men of Hezekiah about three centuries later. He wrote about 3,000, far more than we have here. He wrote about 1,000 songs too, by the way. But uh, Proverbs, uh, 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 Solomon, the Proverbs... Um, uh, that he set down are chapters 10 through 24, chapter, the, the Proverbs of Solomon that the Hezekiah uh, team pulled together and uh, added as chapters 25 through 29. And then we have two chapters that we'll leave to the end. They are at the end, but they're also sort of the dessert. Uh, there are some real surprises in store. Uh, I think you'll find some aspects, especially of Proverbs 30, that you will not find in most Christian commentaries, commentaries. But if you unravel the Hebrew, which we will do carefully, you'll discover it's an astonishing messianic passage. But involve, it, involve, it, it involves some uh, unraveling. So we'll, we'll leave that when we, get to, uh, when we get to chapter 30. We will encounter all through the book of Proverbs three losers. I don't know what else to call them. This is, that's what they are. Three classes of people who desperately need wisdom. And uh, the first is the scorner. The second will be the fool. We'll see what that guy's all about. And the final one is the simple. The scorner, the fool, and the simple. And the scorners. 
What are scorners? Well, they're the ones that mock at God's wisdom for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it's too high for them. It's out of reach. I know many of you could jot down your pad a number of radio commentators that would quickly fill the bill there. Um, some of these uh, probably have uh, a lot of PhDs and H2SO4s behind their names and serve on committees that cast votes on what Jesus really said. They weren't there, but that's the way they, uh, uh, that, that's what they substitute instead of scholarship. The other thing, they will not admit it because they know everything. You know some of these people, uh, they tend to be on the radio or on television, and you get the impression that when they die, wisdom will die with them. Um, it's astonishing to see people who um, are just blinded by uh, the persuasion that they have all knowledge. Have all knowledge. It's, it's, that's one of the... Uh, I used to love the way uh, John Ankerberg used to deal with an atheist. If, he, if somebody's agnostic, that's a different problem altogether. He just feels he can't know. But an atheist, atheist claims to know. And John Ankerberg would always say, okay, prove it. And the guy would be baffled. What do you mean, prove it? Well, if you're an atheist, then you must know everything. Because whatever it is you don't know, God could be hiding behind. But to affirmatively assert that God does not exist implies you've looked everywhere and he ain't there. It's in effect equivalent to saying that, uh, the, uh, that uh, you know everything. And, uh, which is an easy thing to, it's a, that's an easy attack to, to, to launch. Um, now, the agnostic's a little different kind of problem. The agnostic claims he can't know or doesn't know. And uh, he prefers to use the Greek root, root was it agnosco, the, the, from gnosko, uh, agnostic, doesn't know. The Latin equivalent, is the synonym in Latin, doesn't go over as well at cocktail parties. I mean, saying I'm an agnostic sort of works, but saying I'm an ignoramus doesn't quite work. <laughs> but that's the same word in the in, in, in the. The Hebrew word for scorner literally means to make a mouth. So often in Hebrew you have wordplay, but that word, their term for scorner uh, is to make a mouth. And you can easily picture them sneering or curling their lips in scorn. It's a descriptive phrase. It's typical Hebrew. It's a colorful, poetic phrase. The meaning is clear, and yet it's, it's graphic, isn't it? And of course they never... And because they think they know everything, they will not profit from rebuke. And as a result they will one day be judged. That's the destiny of the scorner. And all of these we'll encounter as we go through the text. The second loser that we'll encounter again and again throughout this book is the fool. He's a person who is dense, sluggish, careless, and self-satisfied. Sluggish, careless, and self-satisfied. Not making any effort. There's a guy by the name of Nabal, and that, by the way, the word Nabal in the Hebrew means fool. That's the word. But there's also a guy by that name in 1 Samuel 25, a very wealthy sheep herder. And you can, I encourage you in your notes to put 1 Samuel 25, just, it's a colorful chapter. Basically, Nabal is, is a um, wealthy uh, sheep herder. And uh, David is in flight from Saul. He and his gang are are nearby, this place where Nabal is. And uh, the presence of David and his, ar his small army there, uh, of course, is a form of protection for the sheep herders from the Bedouin raiders and others. And so it's, it's time for shearing, which is a time of festivities. Usually that's like harvest, so to speak. They're, and and uh, uh, David had the presumption that because Nabal had been in his, his protection that he would be open, especially at time of feasting, uh, to provide some provisions for his men as a sort of a, a thank you gift with me. So he sends 10 guys there to see what, he, what they can scrounge up from Nabal. And Nabal's attitude is not only not very uh, gracious, it's insulting. Who's David that I should care? And he, he just <laughs> sends back insults instead. David, upon hearing this, his, situa his uh, assessment of the situation, that he's going to send 400 there and Take him out. He's, he's, he's really uh, upset by this 
um, uh, uh, attitude. Apparently, one of the men that overheard all this gets to Nabal's wife, Abigail, and lets her know that time, trouble's coming because Nabal's attitude has really enraged David and his men. She quickly scoops up provisions, heads there, makes a magnificent speech of apology to David and provides provision. David is so impressed that his anger is assuaged and he, everything, everything's fine. She goes back. Meanwhile, Nabal has gotten drunk with a big party because it's, it, that's the occasion uh, for that sort of thing. So she waits till the next morning when he um, is sober enough to understand the mess they're in that, she, that David, you know, that he had angered David and you don't, you don't anchor the, anchor, <coughs> anger the king, you know, and so forth. Um, Nabal is so upset that his heart goes to stone, to use a scriptural term, and 10 days later he dies. And David um, marries Abigail. So it's interesting. It's, that's to give you a short version of it. But Nabal is a, was a fool uh, in just practical terms. But uh, So he's dense, sluggish, careless, and, and certainly self-satisfied. So the fool hates instruction, according to Proverbs. He hates instruction. So one of the first things you want to check out about yourself is do you hate instruction? If you do, you run the risk of possibly falling into this category. You don't, there are four categories. The scorner, the fool, and the simple, and the wise. How many of you are, are scorners here? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, that's good news. How many of you are fools here? How many of you are um, simple? I've got a couple of cautious hands. Okay. Um, how many of you are the wise? I hope so. I hope so. Okay. No, that's not... That, uh, that's, everybody hesitant. Uh, it's like when I say, well, the most humble person here, raise your hand. You know? No, no. <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay. Okay, the fool hates instruction. The fool is, of course, self-confident. It's interesting how God hates pride. It's interesting how pride gets in the way. See, the only certainty, that the, the, the only certain barrier to truth, there's only one barrier to truth that's absolutely fatal, and that's the presumption you already have it. If you have any opening, any doubt about that at all, you're at least open to listen. But the assurance that you already have it is a certain barrier to it. And that's the worst kind of self-confidence. And of course, the fool has a way of advertising it. He, t he talks without thinking. And I think all of us have done foolish things, so we won't take a vote on that right now. Okay. And of course, the fool mocks at sin. The fool mocks at sin. And all of this, you know, people say, well, you know, we, we live in an age where this is tough stuff because we're taught in university that you have your truth, I have my truth, that everything's relative. Not so. What's right and what's wrong is what God says is right and wrong. If you, without the authority of God, you're adrift. With the authority of God, it's very clear. It may not be pleasant, but it's very, very clear. And uh, So let's get to the next. We've been to the scorner and the fool. Let's talk about the simple. The simple ones are those that believe everything and everybody and lack discernment. And lack discernment. There are many people that may be gullible, but there's something far more here. Those who believe everything and everybody and lack discernment. So this, they're easily led astray by others, and of course they lack understanding. They can't see ahead, and as a result, they repeatedly walk into trouble. And uh, so there's two kinds of people, those that repair trouble and those that anticipate it and avoid it in the first place. And uh, being a troubleshooter and solving problems is great. What's even better is to avoid them in the first place by foresight or wisdom. And then, of course, we get to the category that hopefully we're all aspiring to, and that's to be the wise. That means we listen to instruction, of course, according to Proverbs 1.5. And not only listen, we obey what we hear. Ah, that's the bridge most of us don't cross. We get plenty of head knowledge, but somehow getting the transmission in gear and the clutch released is a, something else again. They store up what they learn. They win others to the Lord. Proverbs 11.30 is a famous verse. We'll get to that. 
And of course, they flee from sin and they watch their tongue. And we always have to have seven, right? And they're diligent in their daily work. Okay. So that's our heptatic list. Straightforward and yet not easy. Do we really store up what we learn? Do we scripture memorize? Do we really have a confidence in our position to lead others to this position? Do we really flee from sin or do we play at it from time to time? Do we watch our tongue? And are we really diligent in our daily work? All these things are the wise and the Proverbs will deal with all of these things. Now we have wisdom and folly. They're, they're sort of portrayed rhetorically as two women. And we have three calls from wisdom and three calls from folly. And uh, wisdom calls us to God and life. And folly calls us to sin and judgment. And those are the, and they'll take a variety of styles and manners here. In chapter one, we're going to see wisdom's first call, and it's a call to salvation. In chapter eight, we'll, we'll see wisdom's second call, and that's going to be a call to wealth, interestingly enough. The Bible has a call, a plan to draw you into wealth. That may surprise you, but it's there very clearly. And wisdom's third call is to life itself, a lifestyle we might use the term, a rich, full life. It's not a life of asceticism. It's not a life, it's not a monastic call. It's a call to real life. And that'll be in chapter 9. Wisdom's first call in chapter 1 will be to the scorner, the fool, and the simple. Those three losers will be called by wisdom to, uh, to salvation. When we get to chapter 8, we'll have the call to wealth. That'll just be to the fool and the simple. And we get to the third call for life. It's only to the simple. You notice that? See, the fool, and the, all three groups were in, embraced in the first call. Two groups, fool and the simple, in the second call, and the simple alone. The other losers have fallen by the wayside, apparently, in terms of the call. So I think that's... Uh, uh, the, the structure isn't that important, except to realize there is a structure. There is a pattern that's going here. Folly has three calls. The first is a call to condemnation in chapter 5, the second call to poverty, and the third to death. That's the end of where folly will lead you, in effect. And what are the results? Well, for the scorner, he rejected wisdom and met destruction. He listened to folly and received destruction. The fool will reject wisdom and was led to death in chapter 8. He listened to folly and received death also in chapter 5. The, the simple rejected wisdom and went to hell in chapter 9. And he listened to folly and ended up in hell in chapter 7. So we find those destinies for those three losers. So that's a little background profile. Let's jump into chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man, excuse me, the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings. It's interesting to realize all through the scripture that Solomon loved what is called dark sayings, enigmas, riddles. And uh, we'll find some of those that will be fun to unravel. In Psalm 78, he says, I will... I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. So this is one of the mechanisms of conveying instruction and through enigmas. And we're going to encounter some of those. In the first few verses, verses 2 through 6, we have the purpose of the book of Proverbs laid out for us. For attaining wisdom and discipline, 
for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. See, the discipline is all through here. For giving prudence to the simple, for understanding Proverbs, parables, sayings, and riddles of the wise. And here we have the key verse in the entire book, not just for the session. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The, uh, this whole area of instruction and discipline is all through here, and it's interesting how we get it backwards with our children, for example. When our children are, are bad, we shouldn't punish them. We should discipline them. It doesn't, that doesn't mean not giving them a spanking, but we need to understand it's discipline, not punishment. We get it backwards. We discipline our criminals and punish our children. It ought to be the other way around. It ought to be the other way around. Um, it always fascinates me to realize that in Israel they had no prisons. Think about it. Anyway, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Now, this is not an instruction for phylacteries. doesn't mean they have to make copies of these and put them in some kind of brooch and wear it around their neck. It's a, it's a, it's a rhetorical device, obviously. But uh, leave it to some rabbis to challenge that. This is the key verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And chapter 9, verse 10, will say the beginning of wisdom. One step further. Proverbs, uh, continuing verse 10. My son of sinners entice thee, Consent thou not. In other words, you're going to find a, a, a stream of suggestions here that are trying to enlist the young man. And the whole profile here in these early chapters is a young man getting ready for life. The father instructing him. He says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up as alive, excuse me, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil to make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Now, obviously, this attempt to enlist the young man in some kind of nefarious plot is generalizable, not the specifics. Obviously, the whole idea here is that uh, not to pursue ill-gotten gains. And uh, because it's going to talk more and more about where that it, 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 crime does, what it's basically saying is crime does not pay. Now, that's hard to sell today. When I grew up, 40s, 50s, and so forth, it was fashionable to say crime does not pay. You didn't come out with a movie that didn't have the crooks caught, you know. It was just a, an axiom of the, the day that uh, crime does not pay. And don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying it does today, but it certainly appears to our young people it does. You know, it, 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 we have successfully in our culture disconnected character from destiny. It, the, 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 the belief that was prevalent decades ago was that if you worked hard and had let it, it really went, had a straight life, that, you'd, that would lead to success and wealth and security. Today, everybody knows that it's what you can get away with. How far can you bend the law without breaking it? And so forth. Um, Different atmosphere. And as exemplary, and I look at uh, Bill Clinton in the last administration, it's not the cause, as a symptom. But uh, you have, you, we have uh, uh, an astonishing list of people at the top offices of our land that were murdered. Over 100. We have uh, um, uh, a, a whole style of administration that uh, you look, it's it, it, it just a shocker. Now, uh, you, look at the UN, you look at the UN with its corruption. It, it seems the higher you go in whatever organization, it's, whether it's in France or whether it's the UN or even in our own country, 
uh, especially in the previous administration, and who knows, maybe in ours too, in the, in the current one. The point is, we clearly, li it, it used to, uh, most of my executive career was in the Wall Street environment. My word is my bond. They, these are men that may not have been moral, but they were ethical. And you, wouldn't, you couldn't conceive of a thing like Enron and some of these other uh, crimes, uh, uh, ethical crimes at, at, at that level. It's astonishing. Anyway, um, this is really a call. This, this is arguing that ultimately crime does not pay. And uh, we, we live in a, in, a, in a culture in which crime seems to, and one in which it formulates the primary policies on the geopolitical horizon. Terrorism pays. Why? Because we reward it by appeasing it, by, by giving it funds. And we don't just do that on the underground, we do it on the White House lawn. Anyway, when they lay wait for their own blood, they look privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Basically, a, a, a uh, expression of the, the fact that crime does not pay. And to understand that it doesn't. Because the, the, ultimate, the ultimate issue is judgment. Now we, have, we hear from wisdom. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the openings of the gates in the city. She uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. This is the the counterbalance. This is the, the, the voice of wisdom crying out against this previous. We have wisdom and folly. Remember, we had three calls from wisdom, three from folly. And uh, wisdom's first call we hear here is, is, is before us between this verse and to the end of this chapter. Continuing, wisdom says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as a desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Boy, boy, boy. This, of course, is being aimed at the individual level. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you couldn't apply this to the national level. We have chosen a path in this country uh, that puts us in, a, in a, a, a collision course with God, with the condoning of homosexuality, with the uh, over a million abortions per year, uh, with the... Uh, morality that we embrace, or lack thereof. Um, and we further are foolish enough to involve ourselves with the enemies of Israel when God has again and again and again indicated that piece of land, that piece of real estate has his name on it. Not the PLOs, not the UN, not even Israel's, except as a tenant under condition of, uh, conditions of obedience. And we in our foreign policy, have invited God's judgment. And then we're surprised with Katrina and Rita and, and who knows what else is coming. Um, we're, it's, uh, we're, we're closing our eyes to wisdom. So, okay, we have uh, these, the scorner rejected wisdom and met destruction. We're just getting warmed up in these things. We're gonna, we've got quite a few chapters left here. Uh, moving on. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me. Think about that. They shall call upon me, and I will not answer. Wisdom speaking. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would, have, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. 
It's fascinating to study God's methods and realize that he pretty much judges people by giving them what they're asking for. And one of the things you and I need to do is kneel by our bed tonight and thank God for the prayers of our lifetime that he didn't answer. Some people, uh, uh, one cl- cl- close pastor friend of mine preached from the pulpit on that. And he says, all you need to do to convince yourself of that is to go to a high school reunion and see that gal that you couldn't live without back then. Therefore, they shall eat, the, getting back to more serious, they, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. How interesting. Think about that one. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. In other words, have peace from the fear of evil. It's black and white, isn't it? It really boils down as to whether you really have uh, the fear of the Lord or not. If you do, you can entrust this, you're on your way. It's that simple. Now, each one, obviously, as you can tell, each one of these verses is a more than adequate springboard for a whole hour sermon and examples from life, from national life, from our personal lives, what have you, people you've known. I'm sparing you all of that for a lot of reasons because the ones that are important are the ones that you conjure up in your devotion on these verses. So I encourage you to to, uh, double back on that. The path of wisdom, chapter 2 protects our paths, chapter 3 will direct our paths, and chapter 4, wisdom perfects our paths. Well, we have the next three chapters that give us the path of wisdom. Chapter 2, wisdom protects our paths. Chapter 3, wisdom directs our paths. And chapter 4, wisdom perfects our paths. And as we talk now, let's keep in mind that the term wisdom is not an abstraction. It's a person. It's personified here as a woman because it's a female gender in the Hebrew uh, grammar. But the person is identified for us in the scriptures, none other than Jesus Christ. So let's get into chapter 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Pretty straightforward. Wisdom in the scriptures means the ability to use knowledge properly, It occurs in this book uh, 37 times. It means Jesus Christ for the believer today, of course, as we see in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And is made unto us wisdom. So there's an identity here that we can uh, ascribe to. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Boy, that, that could be a cornerstone of a whole study. It, it's, a, it's a rebuttal, among other things, of the value of relativism that we inculcate our kids in. It's the Lord that giveth wisdom. Without God, they have no wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of the saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. So if you're in him, you got it made in every respect. If not, there's no chance. It's a black and white situation. That's what the book of Proverbs is going to try to get across in great detail. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee, deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger, which flattereth with her words. 
which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. See, again, I want you to visualize Solomon instructing his young sons and among them, put them on the guard for the adulteress, uh, prostitute, what have you. Um, it's ironic that a man that was the wisest man of his day that started off so fabulously ended up in apostasy because of women. Because he had women draw him away from his earlier commitments. How ironic that he didn't, at the end, fulfill. Even he had, he, he had an incredible life and he produced some incredible literature. But at the end of the day, he did not finish well. One of the goals you and I should have is finishing well. Finishing well. He continues, For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Pretty straightforward stuff. I mean, we could uh, build on each one of these. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Do you believe that? You know, most of us probably say in a, in a heart of hearts, that's most of the time, but maybe, just maybe, there are exceptions. I don't, I don't see any exceptions. I think God is a God of justice, and it will get reconciled at the end. Why do the wicked prosper? What a, what a, big, what a big topic that is. Let's get to chapter 3, the path of wisdom. Chapter 2, it protects our paths. Chapter 3, wisdom directs our paths. Chapter 4, he perfects our paths. And we're in chapter 3 at this point. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Interesting phrase. But let thine heart keep my commandments. You know, it's interesting if you study the Ten Commandments, all but one are operationally defined. You can tell if somebody did or didn't. Or if you steal or if you worship an idol. You can t it's, a, it's an overt act. The, the, the adultery is, a, is, is in the heart. And of course, Jesus redefines all of those for us in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. That the, the real sin occurs in the heart, not in the act. The act is just a follow through of what's in the heart. It's interesting here in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, my son, forget not my law, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. If you keep his commandments in your heart, you flee from sin before it takes root. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. In other words, it's promising um, benefit from these commandments in the current lifetime. We all understand, yes, there will be benefits in the afterlife, or however you want to call it. The uh, length of days, long life, and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thy find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Well, that's a challenge to all of us. And I, that's the way I think you have to study this book. This is not like some of the other books where we have historical or prophecy books where we can come up and make some diagrams and make some charts and show how this fits into that and all that sort of stuff. That's fun. I, I enjoy that, the exposition of it. This is um, the way to appropriate Proverbs is to digest it yourself. These things don't require expositional comments. Where they can, I, where I'll try to as we go forward, get into some of the vocabulary subtleties and some of that. But um, most of these are so straightforward, they're disarming. They're so straightforward. Just a question of applying them, digesting them, rereading them, and asking the tough questions. And how does this fit in my life? How do I relate what I'm hearing here to Jesus Christ? And vice versa. Tr now, this is, this is one of these great verses that is, should be in all our little memory packs. It's a great verse. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Boy, that's a great promise. That's a great challenge and a great um, promise. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. I personally believe every day that goes by, God asks me in a different way, do you trust me? Every day, sometimes subtly, sometimes in very serious terms, God finds a way to ask me the question, Chuck, do you trust me? It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And what's the side of that? He shall direct thy paths. Do you believe that? Make that a personal word. That's a, that's a life verse right there. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. For it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I am so tired of people trying to argue about New Testament tithes. You know, do I, I'm, not, I'm not in the Old Testament, I don't have to tithe. Well, Jesus said his disciples were going to tithe. So I, you, 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 you want to get, start splitting definitions and so forth? Um, uh, Malachi 3.10, of course, is the ultimate rebuttal, but Proverbs 3.10 comes close here. Um, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all an increase. And, the, and, and what, what's really underscored elsewhere, and I think it's implied here too, is not with the seconds, but the firsts. You know, if, if you're going to donate substance, it should be the best of the substance. It's, it's the best of the flock. It's the best of whatever. Not the one you couldn't sell at market. Well, I'll give it to the church, you know. So forth. Um, and I'm not here to disparage you taking cast downs and giving it to the union mission. That, that's all fine. That's a different thing. But I think if you're going to give it to the Lord, you want it first class. Because what you're giving is your statement of how important he is. And then, so then, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Oh, doesn't say grape juice, does it? I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. We're going. <laughs> My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. The Hebrew word here is uh, yasar, which, is, which means to chastise, or the word chastise and instruct are the same word in the Hebrew. And um, it's invo it involves correction. Um, and if he loves you, he'll correct you. If he's not correcting you, uh, that's a huge danger sign, huge danger sign. See, as I say, we get this backwards. See, we, we, we should punish our criminals and discipline our children. We do it backwards. I'm going to punish you for breaking that window. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Uh, discipline, yes, but there's a difference. We need to understand that difference, unfortunately. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. With what? With wisdom, understanding. Do you believe that? What are you doing about it? How does that belief impact your priorities? Where you spend your time and how you study? That's a question. Put it in your notepad and ask yourself that question. Formulate your own answer to that. Do you really believe it's more, is understanding and wisdom more important and silver, and gold, and so forth. Serious question. Length of days in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. So there she is. She's offering both longevity and riches and honor. Not between. Both are there from her. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Do you believe that? You see, this is so black and white that it's easy for us to miss the issue. 
Because it, it is an issue. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. Oh, here we go. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. You remember when James Dobson confronted us, what was the first thing created? It wasn't the earth. The earth was created before the sun and the planets from Genesis 1, right? And there's, that, there's all that to go through. No, no, that's where he's going at. No, no. The wisdom was there first. And who is wisdom? Jesus Christ, the creator. He's the embodiment of it. That's going to hit a climax when we get to chapter 30, but I'll, I'll, keep, I'll try to stay off that until we get there. Then, then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. I had a very vivid demonstration of this sort of thing. Uh, I was on the board of Walter Martin, and we were in Anaheim, and he was speaking at the what, place called Melody Land there, which is a circle in the round kind of place. And, uh, the, and he was in our offices, my partner and I. We were the ones that brought him to the West Coast back in those days. Uh, he was originally based in New Jersey. Anyway, um, he was speaking at Anaheim, uh, 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 Melody Land Center that night, and the Anaheim police came by our office. And they're very concerned because they had threats that they regarded as credible on Walter's life. And they tried to talk him out of canceling or getting a substitute. He would have none of it. And uh, well, said, if you're going to, if you're going to, will you at least wear a vest, Kevlar vest or something? Says, Psalm 46 is my vest. <laughs> he said, he wouldn't have any of that either. And uh, he went, and we, we, we were, always, we were, had our electronics there to tape his talks as we always did. We were pretty apprehensive because the Anaheim police were sure something was, you know, some nut was going to do something. And um, to make a long story short, obviously it didn't. But, but Walter was showing great strength. He said, later on he was debriefing on this, he says, he's doing fine until he got out there on the mic. And because of the, the floodlights, you can see nothing. You don't even see the audience because the lights are so bright. Cause you're, you know, and it's in 360 degrees, right? He says, for a while, he, he, he toughed it through. He didn't say... In his heart of hearts, he was doing fine until he got up there and realized, whoa, <laughs> he's really here, and they're really out there, you know. <laughs> but it was interesting to see Walter, under, under the pressures of that circumstance, unflinch. And uh, I, uh, he, he quoted Psalm 46 at the time, as I recall, but, but I love this. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither the desolation of the wicked when it cometh, for the Lord shall be thy confidence. And in Walter's case it was, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. What a precious promise. Oh boy, withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you have some delinquent payables. I have a doctor, a friend of mine, you know, when we lived down in Southern California, he said he could open the file drawer and his Christian patients were all the ones that were delinquent in paying. And how often that is. You know, you'll find in business, among serious businessmen, what really makes them nervous is when they find out they're dealing with a born-again Christian. Even though they may be a born-again Christian too, but if that's on the sleeve somehow, I remember I had an attorney friend of mine that said when, when someone walked in his office and said, oh, I'm so glad I finally found a Christian attorney. He knew what that meant. That meant he wasn't going to end up getting paid. Um, it's so tragic that the conduct of the Christian community within the business community is not good. And there are many good Christian businessmen that keep it a secret that they're Christian because it's an impediment to a good, prudent business relationship. And there's, there's, a, there's, there's the willingness to impose and a, and a presumption that, that discipline isn't required, that, that is somehow an unfortunate attribute. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. And by the way, verse 27 literally says, do not withhold good from its owners. That's what the Hebrew actually says. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. Boy, 
Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man without cause, if he hath done thee no harm. Sounds so straightforward. It's so easy for us just to skip over. Well, that's not me. And yet, I, th I think it's very worthwhile to get very introspective on these things. That's why they're there. And, uh, and, and if you're not open to the fact that this may be talking to you, that itself is a danger signal. Envy thou not the oppressor, or choose none of his ways, for the froward is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. Boy, boy. Okay, let's see if we can get, squeeze one more in here. The path of wisdom. Chapter 2 protects the path. Chapter 3 directs the paths. Chapter 4 perfects the paths. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father. Here again, get the family setting here. The teaching of the children are the burden of the father. And you guys feel convicted? Okay. That's, uh, I didn't say that. Solomon did. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Who is he talking about? David and Bathsheba, interestingly enough. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give thee to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief. Their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is, dar is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. My son... Attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to, to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That's your most important stewardship. One of the things I often open up a conference with that question of a group. What is your most important stewardship? And most Christian guys realize their career is not necessarily number one. And the wife is nudging them in the elbow, with their elbow. Uh, it must be the family, you know. No, there's something even more important than your career, more important even than your family. Your most important stewardship is your heart. That's where the battleground is. That's where Satan will have you, or try to have you. We're going to talk a lot about his ways. Proverbs is going to get into that downstream here a little bit, but... Keep, keep thy heart with all, keep it like a, a husbandman, like a steward. Keep thy heart with all diligence. You know, we're coming close to a year in. We typically sit down at the end of the year and make a balance sheet and figure out, okay, look the year over. Here, here are our assets, here are our liabilities, here's what went well, here are the problems. You got to sort of take stock, not just financially, but in broader terms. And uh, boy, what an important time to stop and think, what have you done this year for the stewardship of your heart. How have you 
manifested in your heart, God is a priority. Is he the number one priority? I'm going to suggest to you God does not want to be number one on a list of ten. He wants to be number one on a list of one, in effect. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right nor the left. Remove thy foot from evil. This is, this is a rebuttal to compromise. So let's just summarize before we wrap it up here. We cannot avoid decisions. These are not just academic exercises that we take some notes and file it with our Bible studies. Our decisions determine our destiny. We either choose the path of wisdom or the path of folly. You cannot postpone this decision or avoid it. It confronts you every day. Every day. To choose one is to reject the other, and to reject one is to choose the other. There's, it's, it's a black, all the way through, it's black and white. There are no gray areas here. It's pretty crisp. And the question that you need to think about on the way home is, what decision have you made? Sin is always alluring. Folly does everything she can to make sin look attractive. It's not dark and gnarly. It's attractive. M Madison Avenue does everything it can to make it attractive. She never reveals her true nature. She never tells people that her house is the way to hell. That's the reality that the Scripture lays out for us, but we never see it that way. The only way to detect folly is to walk with wisdom. That's, what, that's one of the key insights of chapter 2. And those who walk with wisdom, of course, obeying the, God, uh, uh, the Word of God, uh, will not easily be tricked by folly. It takes time for judgment to fall. Just because you get away with it for a while is not a sanction. The simple, the fool, and the scorner all thought they had it made when they rejected wisdom because nothing disastrous happened immediately. But judgment eventually caught up with them. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. Read that somewhere, right? Okay. Satan always appeals to the flesh. You know, it's interesting how even in the field of Islam, the fact that Islam resorts to violence makes it an appealing place to go. When we're called to be warriors for the faith, often what, the, what we're called to isn't very glamorous. It's a, it's a calling of forbearance, of patience, of forgiving, and all kinds of things. Boy, you get Islam, you take up the sword for Allah. Satan's so deceived. It, it appeals to the flesh to be a warrior for Allah, you know, and so forth. Satan always appeals to the flesh. The wicked woman or strange woman in the, in the Proverbs is appealing to the young man's appetites. She tells him that he can, use his, he can use his body as he pleases and not suffer for it. That's a lie, of course. Satan always deals in lies. And we're going to see more of that in, in the coming chapters of, of the focus on, the, on, on the, the challenge to the young man. Sexual sin does lead to tragic results, both in body and in soul. There's a whole spiritual side of these so-called affairs you hear about that no one talks about. God continues, however, to call, despite all of these things. So long as people will hear, His Spirit will continue to call. It's when we refuse to obey that we begin to get deafness, that is, to the Word of God. Beware of that. If these kinds of indictments don't jar you or bother you or uh, you don't feel any sense of conviction, that should scare you more than anything else. That should scare you more than anything else. You become um, calloused to the call of your conscience. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The book of Hebrews warns you. Well, let's talk about the next session. Read the, next, read the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs for next time. And you might think about anyone you know who fits these descriptions. It's an interesting exercise. I mean in the Bible. There are thumbnails of every person in the Bible embedded in the book of Proverbs, I believe. 
Also personally, now this is a list you don't have to write down, I recommend you don't, <laughs> but uh, something else you might consider, you might consider starting a daily program as part of your devotional reading, just uh, front end it with a, 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 a take the date and uh, read that chapter of the book of Proverbs and, uh, and see how that blesses you. And I suspect that every day you'll find at least one of those things that will reach out and grab you for the day. Well, that's a powerful, powerful way. And there's nothing magic about the date, but it's just an easy way to keep it moving. And if you miss a day as you may, don't try to backtrack. Just keep, just jump right in again. So wisdom and folly. Three calls from wisdom, three from folly. We saw the first call, the fool, for, the fool that's going to the simple. And uh, we have the, we will, in the coming, in the reading assignment, you'll have follies, uh, first call, second call, and third call. And uh, we'll also see the results of it all. Let's stand for closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we thank you for the privilege you've extended to bring us all together to study your word. We thank you, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. We do pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives. We would pray, Father, that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new appetite for true wisdom and understanding. We would pray that your Holy Spirit would just open our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts, that in all these things we, in, we too might grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, that we each would become better stewards of all the opportunities before us, especially better stewards of our own heart. Help us, Father, to really reflect your priorities in our decisions. That in all these things we might be pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.